You're listening to the Brave Parent Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Susan Maples. I'm here for all parents who deeply love their children and want their health span to equal their lifespan. In other words, to be healthy their entire lives. If that's you, tune in. In every episode, we're grappling with contemporary issues that affect every child every day in areas that your doctors either don't know or don't have time to tell you. It's your time to be brave. Everyone, it's Dr. Susan Maples. Welcome back to our Brave Parent Podcast. I'm here with my very good friend, Lauren Eckert, who leads Burning Soul Press and is my uh, book coach and a great friend. So thank you for hosting with me. Um, we're going to talk about a subject near and dear to me that is chew and smile. Oral yes, health. Why is it near and dear to you? <laughs> I know. I know. I'm a bit of a health geek. I know, but this is, you know, this was my life's work. And, you know, it's really interesting because I, as I watched um, Americans health decline and oral health decline on my watch over my decades of doing dentistry, uh, this became a very, very perplexing issue for me. And I don't know why, but in the 1700s, we separated the body into systems and we took all these systems and gave them to their specialist. The heart went to the cardiologist, the skin went to the dermatologist, the kidneys to the nephrologist and on down the line, right? And we did it to make shorter segments for easier, for better learning and deeper dives and um, specialties came about. But then in medical school, for whatever reason, the oral health, which went to the dentist was left out of the medical curriculum. So the medical students literally get zero on oral health, which I don't really understand. So over the course of my lifetime, um, I've been um, really in this effort with a bunch of other people to help bridge the gap between oral and systemic health. I'm president of the American Academy for Oral and Systemic Health. So next week, I'll, I'll be speaking, for instance, at the Swedish Metabolic Conference in Seattle on on oral microbiome and how that relates. And, and I had a conversation with a pediatrician who's in one of the organizers of this. She just happens to be a pediatrician. And she said, it's interesting that during COVID, she said, we used to look in a kid's mouth, but we didn't really know what we were looking for at all. And she said, and then during COVID, they had masks on. So we were told, do not take the mask off. There's no reason to do that. So we stopped looking in their mouth and believe it or not, we all felt that it didn't make a difference because we didn't really know what we were looking for anyway. So now we've just decided to stop looking altogether. And she said, I really just want to know, what would I look for? I that's mean, that's so good to hear, but I mean, it's a bit scary. Too. <laughs> so I want to, I want to sort of break down for you the top four diseases that literally take teeth and function from adults and then talk about the where we saw those coming as children um number one is caries the disease of tooth decay i call it caries disease it's complicated it's cavities and we often think the way you solve a cavity is you drill a hole and you pop some you clean out the cavity and you pop in some man-made substance but that's not the root cause is it the hole is the end stage disease how do we get at the cause of that so that we never lose to structure again in our ever loving lives. That's a huge disease. That one disease affects 84% of school age kids. It's the number one disease for children on the planet. It's the number one disease for all of us on the planet in terms of prevalence. And it has some very, very, very destructive ramifications, especially in underserved populations where they're not affording dentistry. So we get all sorts of you know, infection and all these problems. So caries disease, we're going to talk about for sure. How do we, it's a hundred percent preventable, hundred percent. How do we do that? The second disease, which affects 70% of people my age and 50% of people by your age, Lauren, are you 30? 38, but thank you. Yeah. 50% yeah. of 30 year olds is periodontal disease or gum disease. This disease is the disease well, I almost call it leaky gums because the bacteria that develop below the gum line that get into the bloodstream, not only create chronic inflammation that doesn't hurt, so you don't know you have it, and the inflammation affects 
all the blood vessels in your whole body and predisposes you to arterial disease. But the bacteria that go into the gum tissue circulate around the body and end up in places you never want it. So it influences everything from, it's a causative relationship with um, heart attack and stroke. It's um, related to dementia and liver disease and erectile dysfunction and kidney disease. And the list goes on and on. So not want leaky gums. No, no, you don't. You want healthy gums, gums of steel. The next one is oral pharyngeal cancer. And this is very much in our arena as parents, because we're watching this very, very sad explosion of cancer, largest growing cancer segment in all of cancer. And it's 30% a year increase. And it is also uh, preventable, but it needs some attention to that. We get it through HPV and oral sex and HPV is everywhere. If I put masking tape on the outside of my skin and pulled it off, there would be HPV there. It's the same family of viruses that cause uh, warts, right? But there are certain strains of them that are highly virulent and become cancerous or can very much become cancerous. And they tend to live on wet mucosa. So cervical cancer, anal cancer, penile cancer, and oral pharyngeal cancer outnumbers all of those. This one affects boys more than girls, and 50% of all new cases are between the ages of 15 and 24 years old. Yeah. So we need to know how to help avoid kids, um, how to set our kids up to not have oral pharyngeal cancer. It's a devastating cancer. And see, and the, something that's helpful, right? Because again, as parents, we want to protect our kids and we, sure. we cared about things related to cancer. Well, here's your opportunity to really step in and, and do some of those preventative measures that could lead to that. Yep. It's going to need some discussion, um, some sex talk, which is hard for parents. And it's going to need uh, a, t a good look at vaccination, which is also for parents who are um, you know, a little on the fence now about vaccinations in general, we need to talk about why that one might be something you want to consider. Um, so we'll talk about that today. Um, and then um, occlusal disease, I call it, or we call it, which is the disease of wear and tear of gnashing of teeth. It's basically grinding and clenching teeth that cause chipping and cracking of teeth and wear on teeth. Where's that coming from? Pardon the pun. Where's that coming from? and how do we solve it? And many of you ask questions. My kid grinds his teeth like crazy. What does that mean and what can I do about it? So we're gonna talk about uh, occlusal disease in children too. Well, lots of good topics. So are we yep. start cavities? We can, yeah, let's good. talk about it. Interestingly, <clears throat> most people don't understand this, but cavities is a transmissible infection. So I mentioned before in the gut section that the mouth, where that the body is a home to, you know, billions of bacteria, right? Even the gut bacteria weighs three and a half pounds. We have, for every human cell, we have 11 bugs living on us and in us. Well, the mouth has its own microbiome. We've identified seven to eight. For those who are curious about that, go back and listen to the episode, Digest, where Susan discusses all of that in more detail. If you're like, what about all these bugs in my body? Like she discusses it in more detail in the Digest episode. So the skin and the hair, they all have, they have a microbiome. Then you have a microbiome uh, in your gut, another one in your vaginal canal, vaginal tract, if you're a female and if you're, and, and, and also in your mouth, those are sort of the four major ones, right? You can have them in your ears and nose and a little bit different, but mostly we're talking about those are the four major ones. The mouth um, is a home to seven to 800 strains of bacteria. And let me just tell you, between fungus, which is huge right now, huge growth of fungus, especially among people who suffer from dry mouth, but fungus, protozoa, bacteria, viruses, we have a mix of bugs. There are way more than seven to 800, by the way. Those are just the ones we've identified through DNA ident analysis of those bugs. We literally um, have super great numbers of bugs we live peaceably with. And then we have bugs that, we, that are actually beneficial to us, that without them, we're not good. And you think about when you, not, you take chemotherapy and knock out your immune system. If you kill all the bugs, you have no immunity. So we need them. They're our friends. And, that, and yet there are certain bugs in the mouth that we suffer with. 
And one of them is called Streptococcus mutans. We also have others like Lactobacillus acidophilus, but these are acid producing bugs. Strep mutans loves sugar more than we do. It eats sugar even in the smallest amounts and produces acid. So I tell the little kids, it's like, it's like when you eat and then these bugs eat and then they pee on your teeth, just like when we eat and then pee. Is our, is our urine acidic? Yeah. So what we're really looking at here is the amount of sugar that you feed these little guys. And by the way, when they get the sugar they like, they just flourish. So you grow more. So you not only foster a bigger growth of them, but you produce more acid. And it's the acid that destroys the teeth. We literally buffer the calcium out of our teeth and by the way, out of our bones in our body to quell the acid, to neutralize the acid. Now, let me go back and say, if you could give your gift, your child the gift of having no or very little strep mutans for a lifetime, you would solve the tooth decay problem. How do you do that? Well, if you're a karyogenic mother or parent, um, mothers, I say, because mothers are generally more of the, you know, breastfeeding and caretaking at early ages. If you're using your saliva to wipe their face or you're sharing spoons or you're tasting their food before they taste it, or you're licking off their pacifier to sanitize it when it falls on the floor, you are transmitting your bacteria. Now, if you've never had a cavity, I mean, there are people who literally can drink sugar beverages all day long and don't get cavities. They just have a very small inoculation of these bugs. But if you're a person who has had a big history of tooth decay, you do not want that for your child. You need to not swap, not swap spit. The current level of thinking is if we can avoid it from six months to three and a half years old, we're going to help them. Now, why six months? Sometime after six months, they get their first molars in, usually around one year old. The first molars have grooves. We know that those strep mutans like to take hold, make a home and make babies. They make their home inside of these grooves. So if you're, you know, if you've been, sharing licking pacifiers for your four month old, chances are you're still okay. But at some point after the teeth are coming in, if we're giving them the strep mutans, we're literally giving them the infection of tooth decay, believe it or not. You know, it's crazy. I mean, like this to me is so eye opening because you, you don't think of cavities as being contagious. <laughs> you know, um, and like you said, it's transferable. That's the difference, but well, it's interesting in gum disease. Cause now the new paradigm is that we test all the bacteria that are the 11 most significant pathogens. There are five that are super dangerous. And when those are elevated, I say, you know, I'm not allowed to tell your wife or your partner or whatever that you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to be open mouth kissing with your partner, you better have them come in because, it would be a good idea to test them. And what you find is the thumbprint looks the same. So, so many oral, you know, microbiome for those of you who are single and who kiss in the I'm just day. getting ready to say that. <laughs> Don't <laughs> kiss every, everyone on their first date. Just a the whole new layer to dating. What, can I see your dental records before we move on to the first kiss? Don't have a test. <laughs> But, but when you think about it, um, HPV, even through deep kissing, there's thoughts that we can, you know, certainly transfer those most deadly viruses, right? Or potentially deadly. Um, but I, I will say that we, with tooth decay, you know, the other thing we do is we feed those bugs 22 to 40 teaspoons of sugar a day. That's crazy, right? And so that's average. And so when we think about how they flourish, we often think it's a sugar problem and a jeer problem, but we don't look at the transmissibility. I think all of those are important. To add to it, enamel, um, we should probably understand the pH scale, the acid scale. It doesn't take much 
to shift the neutral zone. And so in all liquids, whether it's, I was drinking a little bit of this earlier today. This is bubbly, it's grapefruit, it's highly acidic, but usually I'll use the soda stream for my, for my soda water because it's, it's tap water. This is tap water. And when I drink water, um, I want to know that it's neutral. I mean, this is a cheat for me. It's, by the way, three quarters full, and it was from earlier, uh, or later yesterday, so I hardly drank it. But it's a cheat for me. What I like to do is know that I'm putting neutral um, liquids into my body. Anything that comes from the grocery store, any liquid at all, is acidic. It's a requirement of the FDA. It, um, to, in order to have shelf life, they wanted acidic to avoid botulism and things like that. So in another body- plug too, for those who are still stuck on the fact that she's drinking tap water and you want to know the difference between waters, there's an episode done on drinks where she also talks about the variety of waters and which ones to choose. So, yeah, well, I, this actually, I'm in Florida and this is actually filtered because I have not had my well, te- my water tested here. So I, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch more on water. Yes. But the fact of the matter is I want neutral, I want neutrality because acid coming in and then 60% of Americans have acid coming up from acid reflux. So we're, we're eating and drinking acidic foods and beverages. We're erping stomach acid up, which shouldn't happen. And then we're feeding sugar to the bugs that make acid. All of that cause enamel erosion. In other words, we buffer the surface of our air. We get that sort of we can get a dull color. And by the way, dull teeth are dull forever because you don't get that enamel back. And then we can cause the tooth decay again from the plaque accumulation where the, where the bugs go in. Anyway, this is a tooth. I liken this pencil to a tooth. To this, she's holding a number two pencil, yellow pencil. <laughs> yellow pencil. And the outer layer of this is very much like enamel. It's the hard, shiny layer. And it's thin, right? Most of it, most of the pencil is made of wood, which is the inner core. And it's, it's a lot softer. And that's just like it is for teeth. The inner layer is called the dentin. It's seven times softer than enamel. It is much more cavity prone. And in the center of the pencil is the lead. And in the center chamber of the tooth is where the pulp goes. And it's literally where the nerve and blood vessel curse through it. When, if you've ever had a root canal, they drill a little tiny hole about the size of that pencil lead. And they take a little file and they clean out the um, center and they fill it with a orange rubber material, believe it or not, like this eraser, very much like this. It's called um, gutta percha. And in any event, when the cavity has a hard time getting through that hard outer layer, but once it does, once it breaks through the hard, hard outer, outer layer and gets to that dentin, it goes a lot faster. And so if anyone ever says we have, I see a cavity, but we're going to observe it, meaning it cavity comes from the word cave, really. It means a dent or a hole, but if there's a little mar in the outside, but it never gets to the inside, it can stay that way forever. So we can literally arrest cavities. But once it gets to that line, now in baby teeth, this outer layer of enamel is so much thinner they're smaller teeth and it's just so much thinner. So we tend to see kids get decay pretty easily. So even though you're a pretty healthy mom and you're raising kids without a lot of sugar, Lauren, um, I just saw you eat an energy bar that had dates in it, or you can give your kids raisins and apricots. And I mean, all of those sticky sugars and sugars in general can cause um, a nice, nice, rich source of bacteria for uh, uh, food for that bacteria. What we wanna do is try to avoid frequency of sugar intake, which is in this environment, it's hard because we teach kids eat when you're hungry, not when you're not, snacking is better. You know, I'm not so sure it is better when it comes to tooth decay, right? Because constant, uh, even simple carbs feed bacteria bugs that produce acid. So snacking becomes a problem. Sipping is definitely a problem. You are going to drink juice, which I don't recommend, as you know, because um, it's a huge bolus of sugar that your pancreas has to handle. And that, you know, if you want to avoid insulin resistance and diabetes and weight gain and fat storage and all that, 
But if you are going to drink juice or something, you'd want to drink it down. Screw tops and sippy cups and Yetis that we carry around with flip tops that keep it sit, you know, that we can sip on it through the day. This needs to be a neutral sub sub substance without sugar. So, all right. So enough of that, yeah. right? <laughs> that was great. Um, but cavities are an issue. I mean, I think that, you know, if you're going to a dentist that's willing to take your money to pop a hole in a tooth and put some man-made product in it, the dentist and the hygienist, the, the preventionists ought to be able to say, um, look at, um, here's how this is being caused. And we want to make sure that we're not going to have this again. Yeah. So you need to really help, you know, you need to be surrounded by people who are root cause oriented. And not right? just fix it and wait for the next one. For sure. For <laughs> yes. sure. All right. What about number two? Uh, number two, gum disease is a really big deal. Um, I mentioned that the, the mouth is a home to all of these bacteria. Gum disease is pretty complicated. Um, generally, it starts with a, a rich um, microbiome of pathogenic bacteria. How does that happen? Some transmissibility, some dry mouth that allows those to overgrow, um, some lack of oral hygiene, um, some just immunosuppression from other illnesses. So there's a lot there. But what we find is that the gums literally unzip and the bone kind of melts away. And while the teeth, back to the yellow pencil, used to be covered with bone, like a tooth is like a fence post in the ground, when the ground starts to slip away around the teeth, you're leaving a lot more of the root in the two, in the bone, and a lot more of the two sticking out to function. We start to get loose teeth, drifting teeth, and you get a fetid odor because the gums are literally dying or rotting. So all of that is how we lose teeth, and it is super prevalent. We measure the amount of that gum unzipping with a little probe that measures from the top of the gum line down. And this is generally an adult onset disease. So we can see it sometimes in kids, but very infrequently. Usually it's gingivitis or red puffy gums without the underlying loss of bone support. It's um, by, again, by 30 years old, we really see this start to take place in kids that are um, adults that are non-smokers. Um, if they're smoking, it can start usually in their 20s. And the bone doesn't grow back around teeth. I often say when I get to see God face to face, I'm going to be asking him a few questions about teeth. And they're all about teeth, right? Because I don't understand why we break a bone and it grows back everywhere else, but not around your teeth. Right. By the way, I don't really understand why we have those grooves in teeth either. That seems like a huge design flaw to me. You can't handle a date bar for crying out loud. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I- um I, back down if you go before I do, okay? I would love- right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And there are a few more questions. And again, they're all about teeth. I don't know why the enamel- is the only part of the entire ectoderm, including the hair, the cornea of your eye, your nail beds, your skin, everything heals when you destroy it. So you get a bad hair job or you don't like your nail color or you split a nail or break a nail. It all grows back, right? Not your teeth. But I did figure out why, because I think that it's because teeth should last a lifetime and not dissolve. And the bone should stay around your teeth and not go away because it is preventable but we need to have our bodies in ideal health for that to happen, right? So gum disease is a real deal. It's very, very hard. The American Academy of Periodontics says that we really can't ever cure this. We can just sort of control it from time to time. So we tend to see it come in episodes when someone has it. I call it the peri-go-round. Around, around, <laughs> around. And yet I do believe, and we in oral systemic health believe it is uh, conquerable. It's just that you need to look at the root cause and shift not only the clinical manifestation, you need to shift to get nice tight white gums that are not red puffy and don't bleed ever uh, when you brush or floss or get your teeth clean to also shift the microbial profile to one that is health. And we can only do that by looking at the bacteria. And so in order to do that, we also have to have the patient who is not diabetic because hyperglycemia won't allow us to achieve that. Um, and gum disease, by the way, doesn't allow them to achieve good glycemic control either. 
Um, so that's what we call a bi-directional relationship between diabetes and gum disease. Smoking is definitely, you know, killer obstructive sleep apnea, which we've talked about a lot. Um, lack of sleep causes the inability to heal and so the progression of this disease. Uh, inflammatory foods and foods that they're sensitive to can really create a problem. So there are a whole host of things we look at for adults. How do we prevent gum disease in kids? One big way is to teach them the importance of health in their bodies and also oral hygiene, which is how do they control plaque on a daily basis? I mean, they're born without any fine motor skills or coordination. And if they're lucky enough to be normal neurologic development and they develop fine motor skills, and by the way, we know by the way that baby led weaning, where they start to wean themselves from breast milk by eating real food, they're using their fingers to pinch and squish the foods as well as their gums. This also allows earlier motor skill development. But when we're teaching them how to brush their teeth properly, um, we are also then progressing at some point to be able to use, to, to learn to use dental floss properly. We typically forget that part because kids don't suffer with gum disease. And um, we don't necessarily believe that flossing reduces cavity risk. The flossing is there to reduce the risk of gum disease to have nice, clean, healthy gums. And what we know is that it does nothing more than the toothbrush. It's simply a way to mechanically scrape the side of the tooth to get the plaque off, to allow those bugs to be surfaced to oxygen. Because if left uninterrupted, the deeper they get in the plaque layer, the more they become anaerobic or oxygen, they, they flourish. Uh, we get different strains of bugs that live without oxygen and those are much more dangerous. So we need to disrupt the plaque layer every day and we need to teach kids how to do that. Yes, absolutely. So they can avoid it, right? Absolutely. And there are a lot more, I feel like with those like unique little flossers, like we have the dinosaur teeth one, right? And it just makes it more fun for them because they see it as dinosaurs kind of eaten away. <laughs> absolutely, it? absolutely. On the other hand, um, I love those flossers, but they, again, oftentimes we use them to click, click, click. I call these plunkers. Instead of putting it in between your teeth, yes. giving it some pressure so it makes a C shape against the tooth and that you're moving it up and down a couple of times against that tooth surface and then lean it the opposite way next to that other next tooth and get down to where it meets resistance way down there, right? So we also need to teach kids how to use it. Yeah. I love the dinosaur flossers, by the way. I tell kids, don't put the different kinds of dinosaurs in the drawer together because they will have a, you'll hear them at night fighting and they look at me like, really? I'm like, yeah, you, you don't want the T-Rex in with it. No, I'm teasing. I love that. I get them going for a minute. Then I tell them I'm kidding. I um, like to do that for my kids, actually. Yeah. Anyway, they're great because they have a nice wide handle for kids to use. But again, they need to learn how to use it. In our dental office, we focus on skill development. We have a mentored approach to individual skill development for each child at each visit. Every child uh, needs a, a personalized approach. Mm. Not like here's what we do for every kid. We show them on a we show them on a model, and then we put the toothbrush in the bag unopened. We need to get it in their hands. They need to know how to. Um, my dog wants to say hello. They need to know how to use a power brush. They need to know how to uh, use a hand brush. They need to know how to use string floss. They need to know how to use flossers and little triangular toothpicks, right? You're giggling at my puppy. I just can't. I mean, like you're talking and I'm like, oh, cute dog. <laughs> so cute. Yes. For those of you who are just listening, know that she's 16. She's pretty blind and she's She's pretty deaf, but she's pretty spry because she's been exercising with me her whole life. Um, she was, even though she's eight pounds, she's been a five mile a day runner throughout her, most of her life. So she's going to live a long time. But um, but also, um, we'll talk a lot more about that in exercise in the in the section on exercise. Yes. Um, so anyway. This is a, um, this is a, this periodontal disease component is important for you to know as adults, because if you have, if you're in childbearing years and you have active gum disease, you're much more likely to have 
um, everything from preeclampsia to early birth weight or early delivery, low birth weight, and even stillborn. We have, um, you know, now have delivered um, babies that were, there's a, there's a story in my blabbermouth book of a 39 week old, uh, 39 month, um, week gestation. In other words, almost full term baby who was still birth at, from a bacterial infection that we always assumed came from the colorectal or vaginal canal until we were able to do this DNA analysis of the bugs. Fusobacterium nucleatum was what that child died from. And it was only in the mother's mouth and only from pregnancy gingivitis. So we really, really want good gum health our whole life. So we don't see these horrific bugs traveling through the bloodstream, affecting all of our other organs. So pretty critically important. The next disease we wanted to talk about was HPV. So this is a touchy subject that most of us think about with our, or with our kids. So this is very it's important. A touchy subject because we're going to talk about vaccination. So I'll save vaccination to the end in case you hate me and you want to hang up on me at that point. <laughs> but it is a brutal disease. I've been through my whole career um, hardly like not diagnosing any squamous cell cancers. And then boom, in the last five years, it's been like, six of them. So it's just growing like crazy and it's increasing at 30% a year. It's out of control. I sat down next to a head and neck oncologist on an airplane who said, it's just, it, it, we can't, you know, if you got head and neck cancer today, we couldn't even see you for four months. We just don't have enough support. And it's because of this. And it's in the back of the throat, the base of the tongue, the the tonsillar pillars, the tonsils back in that area where you can't see it. So literally the way you would know you even had it was you'd have a, a lymph node pop out on your neck and you realize something's wrong and you go in and find out you have cancer. And radiating this area of the body, this is the most brutal because they can't even swallow, let alone eat. So you have to have a feeding tube um, in your gut in order to get through it. It's even so, you lose a tremendous amount of weight. It's devastating. Um, your vocal cords, everything, it's just, it's just it, it'll bring you to your knees. And 82% of it's men. But it's far outpaced cervical cancer. It's, you know, oral pharyngeal cancer um, in middle-aged men alone is mo more than cervical cancer ever was to women. So we're really talking about across the board, men and women. Um, it's a brutal cancer and you don't want it. So we do see a fairly high survival rate of this cancer where we didn't with the traditional oral cancers that we saw from smoking and tobacco because normally it would take years of smoking and toba um, tobacco and alcohol together to get oral cancer. Not always, but normally. And by that time, people that have been smoking and heavy drinking were not well to begin with. So they typically didn't do well with the therapy, with the cancer treatment. Now it's young people, it's middle-aged people. And so we find that the age of infectivity is 50% of all new cases come in 15 to 24 years old. That's a, that's a time when people are fairly promiscuous. They're experimenting, they're going, you know, graduating from high school, they're playing the field, they're, um, you know, so socially, we've, um, our sexual mores have relaxed a bit and we are um, finding body part sex very prevalent. And again, when does that start? I hate to tell you, but 10 to 13 years old is when, you know, about half of kids are experimenting with uh, body part sex. So, and it's considered cool. It's often the, the uh, price you pay to keep a cool boyfriend or to do what your friends are doing. So oral sex is here to stay and it is, the single biggest way we're spreading this oral pharyngeal cancer uh, or oral uh, HPV um, from oral pharyngeal cancer. Or, I'm sorry, uh, HPV, human papilloma virus, which is the risk for converting that. Now, let's talk about the virus itself. There are 200 strains of HPV. Again, some of them we live very peacefully with and some of them we don't. 
they tend to make a home on wet tissue and they tend to proliferate and then you can clear that infection. So not all viruses are clearable. I always say, what's the difference between herpes and marriage? Herpes lasts forever. Oh, God. <laughs> but HPV does not, <laughs> does not last forever. Um, for many of us, if you've ever had a wart on, the, on your hand or on the bottom of your foot, and you might have it for six, eight, 10 years, and then all of a sudden it goes away. Like, what is that? So we can clear this virus until it becomes cancerous. And then these cells are out of control as we hate cancer. Um, so when someone, when I'm able to test for HPV, because we can test from a single drop of saliva, we know what's there. I want to say to somebody, you got HPV, you're at risk for cancer. We really need you to take good care of yourself. Stop treating your body like a rock star and, and you know, pounding drugs and alcohol and lacking sleep and eating, you know, food out of a box in a bag, like really need good nutrition, good water, good sleep, uh, no overdoing substance, put your body in a state of optimal healing for a year. And let's see if we can get rid of this. Because when we test again, if that same virus is there, we know we're at higher risk of HPV. Bringing us back to kids, full circle. By the way, they have moved the vaccination age group up to you're still covered at age 45. I think it goes up to 46, right? So if you've not been vaccinated and you're hearing this and scaring you, go get a vaccination. If you're over the age of 46 and you're single and you're, you're concerned about it um, because oral sex is here to stay, but if you're concerned about it, I, I think it would be a wise move for you to pay for it. Pay for the series of three. It might be 1100 bucks. It's not cheap, but and they moved the age up from what was originally 18 for boys and 26 for girls, because we thought girls were the bigger risk factor because of cervical cancer. Then they made it 20, uh, I think originally it was 20, then it, then it was 21 for, for, um, for boys. And then it eventually it was 26 for both. And then ultimately they've moved it up to 46 just recently in the last, uh, Two years. So we can um, get our uh, 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 10 and 11 and 12 year olds vaccinated with two doses that cover nine strains, the Gardasil 9, which wipes out the risk, uh, it wipes out the risk factor, uh, um, wipes out 76% of your risk for oral pharyngeal cancer. So it's not 100%, it's not 100%, but 76% reduced risk of of getting an HPV infection, which is pretty big. And it's the nine most what we call oncogenic or cancer causing strains. How many of these strains can cause oral pharyngeal cancer? 26 of them have been linked to oral pharyngeal cancer. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But we do know that HPV 16 and 18 are the most prevalent. And then again, the nine most prevalent they've put into, into this, um, into this vaccine that wipes out 76% of your chance of getting um, HPV cancers that cause penile, um, cervical, anal, and oral pharyngeal cancers. So I really think it's that like, high at the same time. <laughs> what's that? It's one of those things where I'm like, okay, 76%, I want 99%. I know, I know. Oh, that's yeah. terrifying. Well, that's why, Lauren, we need to have conversations with kids. Oral sex isn't safe sex. Yeah, just, absolutely. Isn't it? Absolutely. That there are other concerns to be aware of than just, yeah, I totally agree. Oh gosh, four and six here, children. Uh, <laughs> it terrifies me, but I know those conversations. Yeah. In my first book, Blabbermouth, I wrote a chapter called um, Oral Cancer from Love and Other Drugs because I was trying to add in the tobacco and alcohol in that section. But it is true that we'll do anything for love. And, and yet, you know, we, we're taking a risk. And so obviously in a, in a culture where people don't necessarily meet early and bond for life, mm -hmm. um, it, it can be a little bit, um, a little bit daunting. So definitely we want kids to be um, at least armed with some defense. So there you go. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to occlusal disease, the disease of grinding teeth 
A lot of parents want to know, my child grinds their teeth. Why do they do it? And how do I get them to stop? Um, with adults, we typically for years protected their teeth with a bite splint. And by the way, not all bite splints are created equal. Many of them, if you're buying them over the counter, they're chewy. They cause increased stress and strain on the muscles and joints, um, even though they may be protecting your teeth. If you haven't solved the clenching grinding problem, let me tell you, you're going to develop some other issues from it. So we really want to get at the root cause of it. And if you do end up with a bite splint, we want something that will deactivate the muscles so you're not clenching and grinding so much. I write in the book that back in the day when I was studying TMJ, oral facial pain and extreme uh, facial um, dys dysmorphia, um, I studied with a guy named Parker Mahan in Gainesville, Florida. And um, he, was, he was an amazing teacher and a big influencer on dentistry. And he introduced the idea that a lot of pediatric bruxism grinding was from pinworms. Pinworms are uh, uh, intestinal parasite and they're very prevalent and they're not, they don't follow a necessary social economic, you know, segment. They're prevalent in different areas of the country. And they're still very prevalent today. And they literally take their head through the anus and lay eggs there. And generally it's at nighttime and that irritates the, it irritates the, the anus. And so that itching causes tooth gnashing. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So for a period of time, I literally taught parents to spread their kids' butt cheeks to take a sample and take it into the pediatrician. And, you know, so I say this with, with tape, right? The tape, tape masking tape, <laughs> that's right. And it's still, uh, it's still prevalent today. I talk about the prevalence in here, but you know, I say this because there are lots of different sources of bruxism. If your child's taking medications for anything from um, um, depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, things like this, these can there can be a side effect of tooth grinding. We also, uh, it can be from, you know, just eruption, discomfort. Um, but we tend to think the number one cause of this today is from sleep-related breathing disorders. And we think it's from, you know, the fact that they're grinding their teeth to open the airway to breathe better. And we see this in adults too. You see the pattern of teeth where they're worn and they bring them together and they make literally a a Loctite pattern in the front of their mouth where they fit together so well. And you go, you're doing this. And they're like, I'm not doing that. Well, you're obviously doing that. It's probably at night because we know when you give like CPR to someone, you're tipping their head back and advancing their lower jaw to get the airway open from the nose so you can blow some air into their lungs. That bringing the lower jaw forward opens up the back of the throat, opens up the airway. So if they naturally posture forward or even forward into the side, it's typically to get air. And so that's, again, another sign of that um, that we want to pay close attention to. But unfortunately, there's no way to just protect teeth um, as a child because if you're putting any kind of a splint in or an appliance, it keeps them from having the lateral and forward growth that they need to have in their facial development as they're growing. So we really don't want to put a lock on that. It's like binding, a, you know, binding feet in the, in the, you know, some cultures that bound feet to keep the feet small, right? You don't want to bind their bones. So, um, so that's an issue. Susan, this is a, uh, you know, all of these, right? It's, it's one of those where it's like, be aware of this, be aware of this, be aware of that, be aware of this. I mean, and it's so good to have that awareness again, so you can be proactive, you can take those early approaches. Is there a way to truly sum up for the parents listening? Like, okay, now that you know about this, what are steps one, two, three, four, five, or X, Y, Z that you can do moving forward with teaching your kids? Like kind of a summary of those action steps now from being- Well, again, I think teeth are supposed to last a lifetime. Um, you know, fluoride isn't something that naturally comes in our body. We add it to water to help build stronger teeth as they're growing, to give them a little advantage to avoid tooth decay. We can add it to toothpaste and things. You may or may not be a fan of fluoride. There's a lot more about it in the book. There are things that we can do for all of this, but the best way to, to do this is to 
live bravely, be different from your neighbors, focus on health. These, this whole area is supposed to stay healthy and last for a lifetime. And the fact that 84% of kids already by the fourth grade have destroyed two structure um, is a wake up call. It's the canary in the coal mine. It's what the heck are we doing to our bodies, right? Um, we need to think about, again, if, even if you go back to the facial development problems, like go all the way back to breastfeeding, if you can, to, you know, baby led weaning. So they literally have to chew their food, not suck it from a pouch. Um, you know, we need to pay attention to how we're supposed to be. And I think that's what this entire book focuses on. So I think there's a whole lot more in Chew and Smile in the book, obviously, than what we were able to talk about today. But the idea is know what you're doing and find your resolve to do it, even if you're the weird family on the block, right? And buy the book, by the way, for your kids, you know, cohort, you're the parents of your kids' friends, so they don't feel like the weird one. Yeah. But I do think it's super important to learn all this stuff and to see it from a different perspective. We've just lost our way. And, you know, the basics are, are here, but I mean, we're living in a very complicated world. If you're going to eat from a box or a bag, you're going to know that you're harming your body in some way, but how can we do it better? You know, so. Yeah. And like you said, all like every piece, right. Connects with another. And that's why it's so important to go back and read brave parent from beginning to end, because it is truly all those pieces and how they work together to be preventative, to set your child on the best. And I think one more thing is make sure you're surrounding yourself with healthcare uh, practitioners, partners that literally partner with you and help you learn. Healthcare, healthcare providers come in and do something for you. That's great. But what about people that are helping you raise your family, that you can ask good questions and get good answers, that you that they pose good questions for you, that they challenge you a little bit to, to be healthier and to learn more about where things are like this are coming from. If you find that your kid's suffering from cavities, for instance, and you learned more in this podcast than you've learned all the time that you've been bringing them to the dentist, you might be with the wrong dentist. I hate to say that, but find people who partner with you, who help you learn about health. Um, and avoid seeing them for sickness. Yes. Right. Yes. A hundred percent. I mean, yes, Susan, you're Susan and you're unique, but you also work with a lot of other practitioners across the board who are as passionate as aware as you are. Yes, I do. They, yes, I do. So it, it's, there are people out there. You just have to be active in finding them. People who consider it their privilege to partner with you. Mm -hmm. Don't get paid for that. We don't get paid for education, no. not in our culture. Maybe someday we'll get paid for prevention and education, uh, not in our culture. But people who do this because it is their privilege and honor to help you be healthy, not just to treat you when you're sick. Those are the kind of people you want. And those usually are continual learners. So absolutely. Anyway. I know that was a filled episode, but if you have any questions for Dr. Susan Maples and you're watching on Instagram or Facebook, please feel free to leave them in the comments and she would be happy to respond. And thank you again for joining us for today's episode. We're going to be back for another podcast that will sum up uh, all of season one with the uh, podcast on move or exercise science. I'm really excited about that. Yes, be sure to join us. We'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you for listening to the Brave Parent Podcast with your host, Dr. Susan Maples, author of Brave Parent, and Lauren Eckert, founder of Burning Soul Press. Be sure to leave a podcast review and grab your copy of Brave Parent on Amazon or Audible or wherever you prefer to buy your books. Bye for now.